This is the brain. If a psychologist claims that a particular behavior is due to how this organ functions, they're taking a biological approach. But when we talk about how the brain functions, we could actually be referring to a range of different processes. Psychologists have divided the brain into different areas and identified large structures. These structures have different roles and communicate with each other as well as sending and receiving information to and from the rest of the body. The brain's functioning is influenced by chemical signals from the body called hormones. And between individual neurons, the cells that make up the brain, there are neurotransmitters that control neural communication. Alter these with, say, drugs, and you can alter behavior. To take a biological approach to psychology, we also need to include the role of genes, as, of course, the human brain forms into a human brain due to the genes we inherit. And to take this one stage further, to understand why we have the genes needed to create the very distinctive human brain, we need to include a discussion of evolution, as features of the human brain have developed and been retained only because they have helped with human survival. The PsychBoost app now has three features, flashcards, multiple choice quizzes, and see if you can work out the key term from its definition with the key term tester. Try Paper 1 for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free. Learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. The Biological Approach Defining Features As the introduction to this video has probably made clear, there is a lot to the biological approach. But to simplify it for a moment, the biological approach assumes humans are biological beings, so behavior should be explained with reference to biology. Biological structures, neurochemistry, genetics, and evolution are all different aspects of biology that influence human behavior. Biological psychology is a fundamental part of your psychology course, so much so that there's an entire unit just on biopsychology. And the ideas explained in this video will also appear in most of the other units. You might find in this particular approach's video, I go into biopsych concepts into slightly more detail than you actually need for an essay on the biological approach. But as biopsychology is so important, and it's going to get you marks across the A-level, it's really worthwhile trying to understand the core ideas of biopsychology as early as possible. Because I think it's especially important for you to fully understand biological psychology, you can download the matching worksheet for this video for free. Follow the link in the description, print it, and fill it out as you watch. I'll link to a few areas across the A-level, but you'll notice I tried to focus on OCD. That's because you need to learn the biological approach in relation to OCD for paper one. If you've already studied that, it's a helpful reference. Or if you haven't studied it yet, it should be easier after this video. So let's explain each of these features and evaluate biopsych. We can do this in any order. So let's start with the largest biological structure and work down to the smallest. The influence of biological structures on behavior. The largest biological structure that influences behavior is the body-wide system of glands that make up the endocrine system. These glands release chemical messengers called hormones. One gland, the adrenal gland, activates in the fight or flight response. The brain detects a threat and instructs the adrenal gland to release a hormone called adrenaline. This rushes across the body carried by the bloodstream. Its effects include increasing blood flow to the brain and skeletal muscles and reducing blood flow to digestion and to the surface skin, as in an emergency situation, thinking and quick reflexes are more important than digestion. And if you're about to get damaged, you might as well reduce blood loss from non-critical areas. Hormones can also have long-term effects on the body and behavior, such as sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. Testosterone is linked to the sexually diamorphic male body features, as well as to increased aggression. Of course, the most important biological structure for psychologists is the brain. The brain is, after all, the center of all conscious and unconscious thought. The brain is connected to the body by the brainstem. Above this is a structure called the cerebellum. The rest of the brain is called the cerebrum. It has two hemispheres connected by a bundle of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. Each hemisphere is subdivided into four lobes, occipital, temporal, parietal, and frontal. Deeper in the brain is an area called the limbic system, including structures called the amygdala, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. Localization of function is the idea certain brain areas are responsible for certain functions. And while I wouldn't expect you to explain all of this in an essay on biopsych, you will want to know this for the biopsychology unit, 
so it's worthwhile giving a quick introduction of some of the functions of each part. The brainstem controls our core abilities like heart rate and breathing. The cerebellum is involved in coordinating muscle movements and balance. The occipital lobe is for visual perception. Areas of the temporal lobe process auditory information. Areas of the preterial lobe receive sensations from across the body. And the frontal lobe is responsible for rational decision making. The limbic system is the emotional center of the brain. Of course, this explanation is a little simplistic, and many areas have multiple other functions. But in an essay explaining the biological approach, we might want to pick out just one or two. The research to identify the location of many of the functions in the brain were often case studies of unusual individuals. If you've just watched my cognitive approaches video, you likely remember Tan. Tan had difficulty with speech production, only being able to say Tan. After Tan died, post-mortem research revealed brain damage in an area that was called Broca's area, after Tan's doctor. Many years later, brain activation studies confirmed Broca's area is active when neurotypical brains produce language. This research confirms brain structure's role in producing behavior. In this case, speech production. The biological structure of the brain is constructed of nerve cells. Information travels across these nerve cells in the form of electricity. However, these nerve cells don't quite touch. The gap between two nerve cells is called the synaptic cleft. At this point, the synapse, the electrical message has to be converted to a chemical signal, which leads us to the next section. The influence of neurochemistry on behavior. To understand how neurochemicals can influence how we behave, let's take a look at the structure of the synapse in a little more detail. We can see that the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron and the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron close, but don't quite touch. The presynaptic neuron contains neurotransmitters inside structures called vesicles. When the electrical signal, called an action potential, reaches the axon terminal, the neurotransmitters are pushed out of the synapse, cross the synaptic cleft, and are detected by receptors on the postsynaptic cell. There are lots of different neurotransmitters, but when detected by the postsynaptic cell, they're either excitatory, making a new electric charge more likely, or inhibitory, making a new electric charge less likely. If there are more excitatory influences, the signal would pass on. So, if that's the synapse and how neurochemicals work, how does this influence behavior? Well, there are a wide range of neurotransmitters and they have different functions. Serotonin is linked to feelings of well-being and happiness. Dopamine is a reward neurotransmitter and is responsible for intense pleasure. Many illegal drugs like cocaine influence the level of dopamine. Noradrenaline is associated with attention and glutamate is associated with learning and memory. Knowing the influence of neurotransmitters on behavior leads to drug therapies. One class of drugs that are useful to know are antidepressants called SSRIs. They're used, of course, for depression, but also OCD. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, a very well-named drug as they select, they only work on serotonin, and what they do is they stop the reuptake of serotonin. This is a process of being reabsorbed into the presynaptic cell. This keeps serotonin in the synapse and enhances its activity, increasing feelings of well-being and happiness. There is research to show these drugs are effective. A meta-analysis by Samaro compared SSRIs to placebos. Placebos are sugar pills that make the patient think they're receiving drug therapy. Samaro combined the data from 17 studies, including 3,097 participants, into a meta-analysis. The results showed that compared to the placebos, SSRIs significantly reduce the symptoms of OCD. This suggests not only that the drug therapy is effective, but importantly, as we're arguing that neurochemistry influences behavior, the fact that drugs do work suggests behavior is influenced by neurochemistry. The influence of genes on behavior. Going now to an even smaller biological structure, we can talk about how genes influence behavior. DNA is the biological structure and genes are sequences on the DNA. Our genes instruct how our cells are formed and function. For example, there are a range of candidate genes that have been associated with OCD. One important example is the CERT gene. This part of the genetic code influences the serotonin transport we've just covered. We need to understand the terms genotype and phenotype, and it's helpful to use a physical example. If someone has blue eyes, the actual physical presence of blue eyes are the phenotype. They have blue eyes because they have the genes for blue eyes. This genetic code is their genotype. I use eye color as an obvious example, as it's easy to see how genes code for physical characteristics. Biological psychologists 
are interested in behaviors like aggression, intelligence, and mental health conditions. In the same way eye color has a genotype, biological psychologists argue there are genotypes for behavior, and the phenotype is the expression of the behavior. To study the genetic inheritance of behavior, psychologists compare family members and twins. They measure what is known as the concordance rate, the likelihood of one person having a disorder if another person has a disorder. If a disorder is genetic, we should see higher levels of concordance in family members who share more genetic material. An example we can use as research evidence is when it comes to OCD, the prevalence rate in the general population is 2%. However, if an individual has OCD, the likelihood that their first degree relative has OCD, the concordance rate, increases to 10%. This increased risk is arguably due to the shared genetics, with first degree relatives sharing 50% of their genes. Identical twins who share 100% of their genetic makeup, also known as monozygotic twins, have been shown to have a 68% concordance rate for OCD, while non-identical or dizygotic twins have a 31% concordance rate. However, you can see in all of these cases, the likelihood of a relative also having OCD is lower than their shared genetic material. This is because it is possible that genotypes and phenotypes don't match. Giving a physical example again, someone could have a genotype that gives them the potential to be tall, however they don't receive nutrition when growing up, then the genotype will not be expressed, and their phenotype will be shorter than their potential. In the same way, not everyone with a genetic vulnerability to OCD will go on to develop the disorder. This is called the diaphesis stress response. The genetic vulnerability is the diaphesis, and the stressor would be things like childhood neglect, a traumatic event, or adult drug use. Without the presence of the stressor, then the individual can have normal mental health. Again, we can use this as an evaluation. It shows that biological processes alone are not a complete explanation of behavior. A quick note, in this video, I've used physical examples like blue eyes and height to help you understand the relationship between genotype and phenotype. However, when writing about the work of biological psychologists, you need to focus your writing on how genes can influence the expression of behaviors like aggression and OCD. Evolution and behavior. It's likely you're aware of the basic principles of evolution from biology. This is Darwin's idea that organisms adapt to their environment through natural selection. Creatures with characteristics that make them more likely to survive and breed pass these characteristics on to future members of the population. In other words, adaptive characteristics are selected for. Generally, evolution is used to explain physical characteristics. Bigger muscles, faster legs, stronger wings. Evolutionary psychologists argue that behavior is also inherited. An innate behavior that gives a survival advantage is selected for and becomes more common in future members of a species. Evolutionary psychologists explain human aggression this way. In early hunter-gatherer societies, aggressive behavior, particularly in males, was useful in protecting a family, hunting prey, and standing out from the other males when attracting a mate. Those males that were less aggressive were less likely to pass on their passive genes. We are all the descendants of hunter-gatherers who managed to pass on their genes. While higher levels of aggression are not as useful in modern society, we do still have the genes of our ancestors. And this might explain the higher levels of aggression in modern males compared to females. We've covered the biological approach in detail, and I hope that helped you understand the concepts, not just remember them. But if you were to write an essay on the biological approach, then you wouldn't need that level of detail. This is a summary of the main points. Evaluating the biological approach. We can use any of the research studies I've mentioned so far as evaluations. The Nestat and Samara ones on OCD, the case study of TAN, and the family and twin studies for genetics. These provide research evidence that demonstrate the assumptions of the biological approach. Worth remembering all of them as we're going to be using them again in the psychopathology and the biopsychology unit. We can also use a diaphesis stress response as an evaluation of the biological approach as a whole, pointing out the difficulty of separating the influence of nurture and nature on behavior. Again, another good evaluation to remember for OCD and schizophrenia. You might have noticed I tried to reuse evaluations in these videos as much as possible, so there's less to remember overall. For most people, the most obvious positive evaluation of the biological approach are the real-life applications of these theories. Biological theories of mental health conditions like schizophrenia, OCD, and depression have led to the development of highly effective drug therapies that act on neurochemical processes. One example is the antidepressant SSRIs. These work by reducing serotonin reuptake. 
These drugs have helped millions of people return to normal functioning, live more fulfilling lives, and contribute to the economy by returning to work. The biological approach is also regarded as highly scientific. The biological tools used include fMRI scanners, genetic analysis, and direct measurements of biological substances like hormones and neurotransmitter levels. This direct observation, combined with highly controlled research studies, is more objective than relying on self-report methods or inferences used by other psychological approaches. This means we tend to have more confidence in the reliability of biological findings. A problem with taking a biological perspective when explaining all behaviour is it leads to viewing behaviour as biologically determined. Someone has a mental health disorder because of an imbalance of neurotransmitters, or someone is a criminal because they've inherited a criminal gene. This biological determinism has consequences. Arguing there's a criminal gene potentially undermines the legal system's assumption of criminal responsibility. After all, no one can control the genes they are born with, and assuming someone's mental health is fully biological in nature means it's out of their control, and they may need to be fully dependent on antidepressants, whereas a cognitive soft deterministic perspective may be more empowering, assuming an individual can alter their own thought processes. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course including questions on the Approaches unit. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video.